Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we're here with Dario Nardi and we're here to discuss the four INFP subtypes. And we'll start with the dominant INFP. And so this kind of INFP is more driven and confident than others of this type. And Dario calls them the noble champion. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to learn a little bit more about them. Sure, absolutely. Um, a couple of them come to mind. Uh, I've known a lot of uh, INFPs over the years, INFP friends, um, even somewhere in the past dated an INFP. Um, oh my God, the lack of judging. Uh, but in this particular case with the dominant, they're actually pretty organized um, and they can seem um, much more together and on the ball, like you said, like confident, driven, I think assertive is also a word. And like we did with INFJ, and, and I would say true for INTJ as well, all of the types, is, it's important to talk about the third function at the same time, like introverted sensing and where does that come in for them, even though that's not a preferred function. Um, so yeah, they, they can look like a crusader, um, oftentimes they're in some kind of leadership role. They tend to be outspoken. They can uh, be good communicators, someone who's public facing, somebody who's in business or law. Uh, there's a confidence with them. Um, so they can look more extroverted and directing within the, the, uh, the tribe of, of INFP. They are the ones that look more in charge. And, and they are in practice oftentimes, if, if they're not in charge, then they're climbing in that direction and people recognize that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm just thinking of people come to mind that I've met whether they're, you know, maybe they didn't start off this way, but starting an organization and then leading that as a CEO or executive. And of course, there's a big like moral uh, drive behind that. Like they're very clear on what they're doing and why they're doing it and, and not wanting to be morally or ethically compromised, uh, even as they work in business or law, um, some areas which politics, which often require, uh, what is it called? Sausage making. Um, uh, that's what they say Congress is like. Uh, on the downside, they can come off as a little bit rigid um, and dogmatic because they really are sticking to that yang energy of of introverted feeling this monastic i'm aligning my beliefs and my behavior and my organization and all of that are going to be like aligned with each other to to be like not a hypocrite basically and and to walk the talk and and all of that um and yeah so they can come off a little bit preachy as part of being communicators but they also can be incredibly elegant and, and have it together as a leader. I mean, it's, even if they're in, say, the military or something like that, they've risen to a position um, where their introverted sensing has also come in and allowed them to um, be comfortable with hierarchy and just be aware, like, oh, this is, this is how it is. And I would say for all of the dominant, what you notice with them is even if they're not in a leadership position, they're very comfortable walking up to leadership. Leaders talking to them, being like, yeah, I'm gonna talk to this person. Um, another thing maybe that's on the downside is even though INFPs are decent at perspective shifting, I mean, think Isabel Myers, for example, I mean, the whole thing type 16 types, uh, very horizontal model. People are different, but equal in their gifts, um, not the same, but, but equal value. Um, this is a version that's probably the most adverse to perspective shifting because they do maintain that like clarity as a leader. Yeah, it almost seems like this kind of INFP is more confident in talking to others. They're more comfortable in leadership. They have that strong moral cause that they're fighting for. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dario, that a Yang FI almost looks a little bit like the st stereotypical NI feel that people have, like a singular feeling about something, like a singular cause, but it's more about the emotion and the drive and the cause mm -hmm. and the personal conviction rather than a singular vision. I could see how these things could be a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so one big difference I feel between FI and NI being a type that has pretty good access to both um, is that FI has this like uh, 
clarity of purpose. It's not about the end destination. It's really about their behavior and why they're doing what they're doing. So they could be in a very difficult and distasteful job. Uh, like I said, a politician, but let's say it's something like running um, a halfway house for recovering drug addicts. Okay. Not, not just being a service, but like running it. Um, they have to maintain a tremendous amount of like internal fortitude and be really clear on like what they're doing and why they're there. Not because they have some future vision of it, but there is an ideal or hope that they constantly check with all the time and that they speak from. And you mentioned about communication. Um, many times they also have the yang sort of energy of extroverted intuiting, which can come off as like a marketing or salesperson. Um, but can also be really effective in terms of, say, telling stories and bringing together in the moment, like, oh, yeah, what are the things that people mentioned at this, say, like at a conference and then summing it all up and, and sort of locating what was the central, like, uh, ethical or moral theme that underlie, you know, underlie what's talked about. So it's if you know, you get them in a corner and ask them, like, why are you doing what you're doing? Like, they absolutely can tell you. Whereas an NI person usually has a driver vision for something to happen. Like, oh, I want to write this, the great American novel, or imagine people going to Mars and living there. And then you ask them why. And they're like, I mean, they, they can give you some reasons. I can make up reasons all the time. But the reasons are just like sort of random ad hoc reasons that don't go back. Like I really have to, would have to stop as a dominant NI user and ask myself, like, what is the deep human answer or need that's being addressed? And, and then checking with that all the time as I go, like not necessarily. So NI is a lot more about a, like a creative process, like feeding the vision. And FI is a lot more like checking checking, 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 like, does this match? Is this aligned? Like, is this harmonious? Whatever it is. Thank you for that clarity. And so I'm curious, how do you tell apart an INFP who's dominant from an ENFP, would you say? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, especially when we get to the creative uh, subtype in a moment, the, that INFP can really look ENFP-like. Um, I would say at the end of the day, one is um, the ENFP is still, uh, very rarely, in fact, even when I think of dominant ENFPs, to get them to talk about the FI portion is pretty challenging. Like, what, why are you doing this? Like, not to make up an answer, but the, like the humanistic answer for it. And the FI has, even the dominant role has given a lot of contemplation to it and they still need to recharge. And there is a certain subtlety or allowance because at the end of the day, all INFPs are still behind the scenes style relative to other types like ENFP. So they're still going to be the person who listens and brings everything together and then moves the group forward. Whereas the ENFP is like, yeah, let's just like get people energized and excited and, and imagine what if we did this and there, there's like a different balance of, of energy that's there. And the ENFP will usually have more short-term goals, like, oh, we're going to finish making this commercial or we're going to finish this, uh, you know, uh, project in the organization. But beyond that, they're also ready to just move to the next thing. And getting the dominant INFP in particular to move to the next thing is like not in their vocabulary. Like, this is the thing. Yeah, the INFP is more of this is the thing. Introverts tend to have that more one thing and then want to stick with it, whereas extroverts tend to like the variety component of it a lot. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for answering that. And so if you're in the audience and the terms in charge and behind the scenes are new to you, I have a playlist about Linda Barron's interaction styles down below for you to learn more if it's new terminology. Yeah. And so that brings us to the creative subtype. Mm -hmm. And so INFPs of this type are more exploratory and social. This might be the more bubbly INFP in comparison to other INFPs. And Dario calls them the curious dreamer. And mm -hmm. so I'd love to hear more about them. Sure. Um, there's this 
experimental aspect to them. There's uh, they're they're not going to be they're going to be active and social, but not confrontational or dogmatic or pushy. Um, and unless like you really, really, really push them. Um, there is this rebellious element. They do like to travel. They, they will often, as the word creative suggests, be in a creative role, like as an artist, a musician, something like that. Not necessarily, um, but that often is, it comes along with it. There's this playful, imaginative idea generation. Um, and in the brain, we see this starburst pattern where everything is connecting to everything else. So they can feel a little bit scattered, even more than other INFPs. Whereas the dominant INFP really has this like frontal brain wiring that's a lot more like quick reacting um, and, and focused. Uh, I would say that this curious dreamer is eclectic. And I mean curious in both the, the general or American sense of the word and the British sense um, of curious of being odd and curious like being interested in what is this. Uh, and they are the, the version that can look the most like an ENFP, but they also need a lot of alone time to balance it out. So a lot of their different interests, yes, they're social in this and that, but the actual creative act itself is something that they're usually doing on their own. Although I do know somebody, and, and I, th I think this is sort of common with all the creative subtype, me being creative subtype too, is that they do enjoy small groups or a classroom or something like that. Uh, the one I'm thinking of is an art teacher for kids. Uh, and I know another one um, who I haven't done brain imaging on, but she is um, she, she teaches theater for kids uh, and helping the kids like bring out their creativity in a very supportive way. Um, and the one that I do know, I mean, the art teacher is also like she travels and she has a lot of different interests. Um, sticking to one career, one course uh, of activity, like is very difficult. And they're definitely the subtype that needs the most stabilizing, like something in their life, whether that's their spouse who maybe has judging preference uh, or a location. This is where the introverted sensing can come in and be like, yes, you're here at this location. And what allows them to continue to do the theater or the artwork or whatever it is that they do, the travel is that they have some, some grounding mechanism that keeps them in place, like an art studio or something like that. And as long as it's set up, then, then they can return to it. And they like this idea that like, yeah, I'm not just sitting there by myself all the time. Like I can go and like interact with people and get some ideas off of others and then retreat to my own thing. Um, so there's this, this definitely there's this right bias there and this experimental quality um, that can sort of look like a get things going. And I would say it's the version just as the dominant INFP has the most difficulty with perspective shifting because they're very clear on what they're doing, why, and so on that this the the curious dreamer is the one that um is the most like challenged in terms of staying in one place doing one thing getting stuff done and i i would want to mention because this is going to come up with normalizing that a lot of infps are in some kind of creative profession or have some creative aspect to their lives which is fine and everybody has i mean we call them subtypes but facets or variants um the difference is, is that this, the creative one, is probably not a great fit for having corporate clients, for example, because there is this rebellious, like, I'm going to create because I want to create. And, and I'm putting something out there, and it's not because I'm following some play, templates and processes to produce stuff for my corporate clients or whatever it is. Um, so there really is this fun loving and wearing costumes and going to parties and having like very, like even more than other INFPs, this eclectic musical tastes um, and, and sort of like all of these like different interests that in their mind, they don't, these things don't need to be stuck together or like harmonized or something except, you know, within themselves that there are things that they like and enjoy. So it almost seems like they have double the NE in comparison to other INFPs. They're it's easier for them to tap into, or it looks like they're more honed in on that too, because of the exploration. Like 
Joel and Antonia even call extroverted intuition in their system exploration. And so it's going to stereotypically look like a supercharged NE INFP. And so. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really the person that you can go and meet at a conference or in a bar or, the, you know, the party, like whatever it is. And this person is not short of things to say or enthusiasm or something like that. I mean, while their battery lasts, you know, then then they're there and they're interacting. Um, and there was one more thought I, uh, that I had about that. Oh, right. So this is a way that Antonia has talked about it too, is like getting really more to the yin and yang of it and understanding that the creative subtype has this marketer energy on the outside. Um, but on the inside, it's actually very diffuse, diffuse. So their introverted feeling is very much with this person in this relationship, I'm this identity or sort of like cloud of identity. And with these other people or in this other situation, I'm this different cloud of identity. There isn't this honed clarity. And if you ask them like, why are you doing this? They're going to give you an answer that maybe fits for your relationship with them. But they're going to have a different answer in a different relationship. And there's a lot more flexibility because they're also being creative with their own identity. Whereas the dominant and the normalizing are usually like quite focused on what their identity is. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. The yin fi can be very flexible about discovering itself and it might spend so much time processing its emotions. It's very fluid with its identity and can change between them. Yeah, yeah. And, and if there are things that come up like, oh, I'm going to like paint something that's horrific. I mean, not that they want to do that, but um, but they're comfortable with that negative emotion and bringing that in and like being able to hold that for a while. Or the contradictions, it's like, yeah, well, these different aspects of myself don't really harmonize in an obvious way, but they must harmonize because I'm a person and I'm me. And so they're so comfortable with holding those, those different things. Um, yeah, underneath it's, it's much more diff diffuse. Mm. Well put, well put. And that brings us to the normalizing INFP. Dario calls this the fateful supporter and they are more specialized and conventional when compared to other INFPs. And so I'm wondering if you could go into that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the folks that have this much more like farm field, like brain wiring. Um, and, and I should mention that even though the brain wiring is sort of what defines the subtype, uh, that people still have, I mean, the INFP still have their favorite brain regions, regardless of what subtype. Abstract use of language and listening to voice tone and awareness of identity and values. And they tend to be sort of like right hemisphere kinds of things. It's just how they're wired up differently. Those, those different skills, how they're connected. Um, but they have much more of like this linear pattern to them um, and sometimes even a little bit more like left brain or even more back of the brain um, that makes them look a little bit more analytical or um, a little bit even more introverted than than some other uh, INFPs. In any case, what's there is there's this more like step-by-step, uh, -step, like the introverted sensing is a lot more obvious. And they very much can function in a setting in a support role where they're supposed to follow a process where there's uh, roles above them and below them and, and horizontal with them, uh, where there are courses that need to be charted and that they're going to follow those, um, that they work with templates. And yes, they're the artists that can have like corporate clients. Um, they, they can be... Um, you know, things like nurses, uh, doctors, um, even a, a lawyer too, as long as it's more like low key behind the scenes, like support kind of stuff. There may also be, uh, I'm thinking of one in particular, uh, an in-law who has worked various jobs. I mean, he's very much a, a family man, uh, has worked in uh, mechanics and construction and that kind of thing. So his inner STJ is well-developed. I mean, it only takes one minute sitting with him to realize like, oh no, he's so not an STJ. He's not an ISTJ. The INFP quality is there, but the actual job, the day-to-day -day stuff is like really more hands-on 
physical, uh, you know, step by step kind of work that needs to be done. And they really have a lot of endurance to work. Well, one, to get through an educational process, because like going through like advanced education, let's say is the INFP who's an engineer. Okay, they need to develop this analytical left brain skills. When presented with problems, there's like a plug and chug formula approach. Like you learn what that is. Um, there, there is this process. And, and when the organization also is challenging, they have that patience in their support role to, and they figure it out in different ways. They're like, you know, I stay in my lane. That's like one answer to it. Another is remembering, you know, I'm why am I here? I'm here for my family and my community, not because the job is super exciting. Um, and and so it really can come off as m the most like conventional and mainstream INFP. And in many times, like people are like, oh, no, I'm intuitive and creative. So how could I be normalizing? And people might think of the word normie. But a lot of people, I mean, th that's like the biggest group is is the nor normal people. And this is like the most normal INFP. I, I mean, I think once you scratch the surface under a while, you like you get the other stuff. But like with the the normalizing INTJ, the interests are adjacent, like they're hobbies. So for example, this INFP might be uh, an office worker during the day, and then they play role-playing games on the weekends. You know, it's like their side interests that they have their outlet, where they play music with some friends on the weekends. And, and that's where they, where there's like this improvising and composing and so on that, that are also aspects of, of INFP. Uh, and that really shows up the FI is this like really strong dedication and um, endurance, this, this, you know, almost self-sacrificing kind of caring that can happen. I mean, it can be a little bit, it, it's funny because, you know, I, I call it the faithful supporter, but I realize when you mention it, it could be called the fateful supporter. And because there is an element of them that's like fate, like I'm doing this because it's fate. And they're the most, whereas the dominant is going to be like, no, we're, we're going to like, we're going to bring change to the world. We're not going to accept fate. The, the creative subtype is like, Oh, fate, like, let me draw a picture about that or like sing a song or whatever it is. Um, let me test my fate by going to some random foreign country. Um, whereas the, the normalizing really takes upon themselves the burden of their fate and, and is very much like can become stoic. That's where their introverted sensing can also show up as well as the part that yeah, they do like their comfort. And to be frank, for INFPs who are among the rarest type in the population um, to find that, that like that homey, comfortable space. So that introverted sensing is not neurotic, that it's actually relaxed and it's, it's need for comfort and stability and so on are being met. Normalizing is meeting its needs. Very interesting, Dario. And so I have a question. You mentioned the word normie and how they're like, oh, I'm INFP. Am I just a, a bigger part of the population yeah. out of the INFPs who are a smaller part of the population? So I wonder, with your brain scans, you notice more common brain scan results and less common brain scans you see in the world at large and also within the type community too, what your hypothesis is there? You know, I am... I, I did a pre. This is a great question, and I did a presentation on this for the British Type Association like two years ago. And I, I don't know. Like, I think that in the future, I'm not going to venture in that direction unless I had like a hundred times more data, um, because the sample populations are really, uh, even though we, with over 600 people now, still most of the people I get are people who are self-selecting, and they're also part of specific populations uh, like human resources, people and psychologists and or at least type enthusiasts, coaches, consultants, whatnot. I'm not not all of them or but that like they're overrepresented compared to the general population. So it's a little hard to say. And where I get the other people oftentimes is because they're a spouse of somebody who's interested. And so they come in and they do it, too. 
and then we then we tend to get something that's different. And culture has a big role in it. So a Japanese INFP is going to be different from an American INFP just right off the bat. And I do see, for example, among Americans. Uh, and I don't mean Westerners, by the way. I mean, specifically mean Americans, um, or we'll say like United States. Uh, the, they're more likely to have that starburst pattern compared to other people of their type. Whereas people in Europe are more likely to have that diamond-shaped pattern. People, I haven't done East Asia. That will be coming in April. Uh, but in India, at least, we see a lot of normalizing. Um regardless of what the person's type is. But I remember I had a client who was a director of accounting. Now he was ENFP rather than INFP, but he showed the starburst pattern. And he's like, yeah, no wonder I'm so weird. Like I always knew I didn't belong in this profession. And, but his parents sort of pushed him to do accounting. And the same could happen to an INFP very easily. They get pushed somehow into doing accounting. And then they realize like, oh, gee, I don't really belong here. Um, in the case of the ENFP, he simply rose to a director role. So he's really managing people, which is what his skill is. Uh, for the INFP, they would also need to bring in something that was their creative element. Um, and maybe the person who communicates the accounting results to the rest of the organization to the public or something like that. You know, something that is or, or maybe they're like, gee, I really like I need to have a career change um, that could, that could happen, too. Um, I think it's a little bit of a challenge with the NFPs for to talk about them because even though like INFP is such a small percentage of the population, they also are inordinately represented in media. So the people who write and create movies and music and art and all of that, like they're heavily skewed. There's a lot more NFPs there than there would normally be. Just like if we were just to randomly, you know, take a sample of the population as a whole. So we might think like INFPs go through life. On the one hand, they're like, oh, there aren't a lot of people like me, like one in a hundred. So that means in, in a typical classroom of 25 students, there are zero INFPs. Um, and the same INFJ and, and maybe even INTJ, they're, hmm, nah, yeah, probably zero. And then over the course of the day, if they have six classes, they might meet that one INFP might meet one other INFP. So they think like, oh, I'm pretty rare. But the fact is they can go to the movies, open a book, listen to a song, and they're like, oh, INFP stuff, INFP stuff, INFP stuff all over the place. Um, so there's the, the, the sort of nice you know, to be able to get that at least in the cultural level. And, and I think that also gives them a sense all the time that, that there's like these, like, oh, I'm alone in my own local world, but in the global world, like my life has, like there's reflections of me that I can relate to. And um, I feel that that's like, not, not all types enjoy that. Okay, so INTP, is a type that is not highly represented and also is not all over the media or something like that. They have like a picture of Albert Einstein and then what? You know, it's a thank goodness like the society values like innovation and technology and thought leaders and that kind of thing. So INFPs can find their place, uh, INTPs. But I think that it's like INFP has this like very, very curious role within culture it being both very rare and also like having a very high profile culturally yeah that makes a lot of sense so while you might not find one in your local life in media and in other places they're very prevalent and so then there's harmonizing this kind of infp is more empathic and reflective than the typical infp and so this is almost double nf ish mm -hmm. I, and i wonder if Types that are not INFP but are harmonizing might mistype as an INFP because they are harmonizing or as an NF type because of yeah. being the subtype too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. And Dario calls this the empathic counselor. Hmm. Um, so I, I'm just thinking of someone I know pretty well now and uh, who's ISFP and knows now he's ISFP. Um, in fact, two people, no, two fall into this category. Um, and they really wondered about INFP because they're like, yeah, I have this intuiting side and so on. And they're both the, well, one of them, I don't know for sure, but the other one I know for sure. No, no, no. I both, I know both of them. Yeah. No, what am I talking about? I know both. 
uh, they both did brain imaging and they're both harmonizing. And they read the harmonizing description of INFP and they're like, yes, I can relate to this because it's also a harmonizing subtype. But then they read the other INFP subtypes, the other facets of INFP, and they're like, no, I'm, I'm not like this. Uh, and then they go read ISFP harmonizing, and they're like, yes, very much. And then they read the other facets of INF, ISFP, and they're like, oh, yeah, I can see when I'm like this sometimes too. So I think that's a really good test, actually, if anybody's ever wondering. So look at all four subtypes. And if there really is your type, say INFP, then you're going to relate to probably three out of the four. And you could even see how you could be the fourth one. You'd be like, no, I'm not. But like, I could be. Like, I, I understand that. Um, whereas if you're really on the line thing, like, oh, am I like INFP or INFJ? I would be like, go read the subtypes. And you're probably going to relate, say, person's INFJ. And they read one of the, like harmonizing INFP and they're like, yeah, I can really relate to this one. But I'm like, go read the other INFPs because then you're going to see like may maybe, but probably not. Um, and then this is also there. There's this both. Well, I, I don't want to speak too much because I'm not like an expert in socionics, but but in both the Myers-Briggs universe and the socionics universe, there is this INFP stereotypical empathic counselor. And, and it is the stereotype, the harmonizing, just as the, the dominant is not, people are like, oh no, they can't really be an INFP because they don't have stage fright. And like they're a CEO of an organization. I'm like, yeah, there are INFPs or CEOs of organizations. I mean, I, I know some. So uh, they they exist and no they're not mistyped. Um, one of them is even a like big thought leader in the type community for decades. Roger Pierman. Yeah, Roger is a great example. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. Roger, I think is like poster child for for dominant INFP. Yeah, um, I have an interview with him down below if you want to see dominant INFP action there. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, uh, and then this version, so what do we mean? Like more empathic, more reflective, more like sophisticated in their thinking and contemplating process. It's because they have these sort of diamond shaped networks that maybe just one, but maybe a couple, maybe not even fully formed, but sort of like zigzagging across the brain that connect like left and right, back and front in a way that is sophisticated and usually meeting some specific need like whatever it is that they're doing whether they're like a, a therapist or a novelist or a diplomat or whatever it is um and and it's like a way of thinking so if you imagine somebody who's like uh, infp well infp actor is probably the creative subtype i should find out i know i know infps in the acting community um it'd be a good group to look at um but they have these diamond shaped networks and these different modes of thinking that allow them to make sort of this dramatic leap um, and, and really, I would say, what differentiates them from creative, one is that they need a lot more alone time. They're a lot more sensitive, uh, especially when younger, probably a lot more morose. And there is this very much allowing, like working off of others and allowing others to drive the experience. So if we think they're, they're like double yin, and, and this yin quality for extroverted intuiting is the highly observant, quiet, humorous catalyst that waits for the right moment to tell the, the best story in a way that's funny that that person will accept and that will slowly plant a seed of change within the person or just evoke something interesting in the conversation. And then the yin introverted feeling is going to be very comfortable in being this way in this relationship and this other completely different way in this other relationship. And they don't have a need to like get everything to be aligned and, and all of that. I think a really great example is this Norwegian film, uh, which does have English subtitles, um, The Worst Person in the World. And it just came out recently, like a year and a half ago, uh, and follows an INFP uh, woman, young woman, and she's just such a classic example. I wouldn't necessarily say harmonizing because she's still finding herself, but this really great example of yin introverted feeling um, 
and and sort of struggling like she definitely doesn't do a lot of the yang extroverted intuiting so it's that's more yin as well like observing and responding um and this is a person that, that makes a really good therapist or novelist or diplomat because they shift if dominant is the worst of perspective shifting among infps then they are the best because their role is to meet each client or customer or wouldn't I don't know if they'd even think of the word customer, but each person for where they are, each character for where they were for where that person is. So they can write a novel about an evil person and not feel conflicted about that. Whereas the dominant subtype for sure would be like, well, first of all, why would I don't have time to write a novel? There's more important things to do unless the novel really serves a purpose, like communicate like Celestine prophecy. It's communicating something that that is, you know, important to the their mission. Um, and they're they're much more comfortable with this, this, this client who's come to me, let's say they're a therapist, it is actually like really messed up. And and you know, rapport building is the first step to meet the client at their view and experience of the world. And then to discover with the client, not direct where the client is going to go or envision where they could go, but work with them to help the client not only discover who they are deeper down inside and get in touch with that, but the therapist INFP doesn't presume to know what that is. They don't presume like they, this person could be completely different culture, completely different political attitudes, whatever it is. And they're like, this is the material I have to work with me. So there's like um, a receptive quality. And, and yet they, they at the same time obviously need to be very resilient because there is, they're, they're in this receptive role, but they don't want to get lost in that. And the way that David Kiersey Sr. would describe it is like a bunch of marbles. And when the marbles, you just let them all out of the container, like, you know, they just go onto the floor. And, and they're, they're aware that they, the harmonizing one doesn't want to spend too long in that space uh, in a way that like is really debilitating to them. But they're also very comfortable with this open-ended approach to life. Very, very open-ended approach to life. Yeah, they're receptive to what you bring to the table. That's beautiful. And so, Dario, I'm curious about traits that all INFP share, regardless of their subtype in your experience. Yeah, yeah um, I think one that stands out the most for me in getting to know them is the INFP's ability to, um, either for themselves or with others, like in, in their close relationship or, or even potentially at a society level, return to the core values or the core identity of who they are, even when they don't know what that is. So what I mean is like, it's, it's sort of funny in a way you would think like, oh, a type like INFP would be so clear on their identity like their values and beliefs and convictions and, and so on with introverted feeling. But that's also the hero introverted feeling and that that hero is constantly doing heroic works and sort of like, you know, Hercules in a way and, and the task, the 12 tasks that Hercules faced. And a, a big piece of that then is to keep returning to, to discovering how to be more authentic. Um, which means that at some point they do need to look in the mirror more deeply, more authentically to see like who is actually here. And when they're working with others, it's to help them, whether it's in the sense of like an art teacher or a theater teacher, helping the student become in touch with the creative essence in themselves, um, or the, the normalizing INFP who's very, attuned to supporting the essence of the people around them uh, who are important to them, that there is this constant like returning and, and not always to the same place, understanding that just like an INTP will keep delving into their theory to clarify it and make it more intricate and maybe make some corrections to it, that the INFP is willing to come back and look again and see 
like, oh yeah, there are there, there is this other side to me that I didn't know was there. Uh, another theme of INFP is the ability to hold opposites, um, which I think that they share in common with the NI folks. I mean, INTJ and, and INFJ, um, although for different reasons. Um, this is sort of like yin and yang, dark and light, good and evil, uh, active and passive, night and day, uh, fire and water, all, all of these opposites. And they're somehow comfortable with that and working with that. Um, I think for introverted intuiting that we we try and step up or step back to find like, well, these are opposites. And we're going to, like Carl Jung, look for an alchemy to resolve the, the opposition that's there. Fire and water are just a part of a family of elements. And so we'll step back and look at that family of elements. Um, is more conceptual. Whereas I, I feel like for INFP and, and ISFP, there, there is this like emotionally and as a person to live with these contradictions that every person uh, has within them the capacity for, for good and evil. And no matter however we're going to define those um, and coming to terms with that. And, and how do we live with that uh, without, say, you know, like being able to explore some part of ourselves without falling into it completely? Um, and, and so I think it's the ability to hold those opposites. Um, I mean, I, I've known some dominant introverted feeling folks who hold such contradictory beliefs, but they're holding them. You know, it's like a dog in one hand and a cat in the other. Or it's, you know, fire in one hand and water in the other, and they're holding those. And to me, that's like, as long as they don't get burned up or drowned in it, then that's really quite powerful to be able to hold that. And then what comes out of it, that's what makes INFPs, for example, really good. When they're willing to really engage in the process, as opposed to preach to the correct answer or road, uh, to go down to create like great novels, for example, or great character actors to play the evil character or whatever it is to to write Voldemort authentically with his own motivations and and it's understandable and dare even say human and maybe the human who got lost. So I really believe that's another theme. Um, and then, uh, you know, I could go on and, and name a bunch of themes, but I think a third thing that fits in, which I've seen a lot of them is, yes, there is this, this extroverted intuiting capacity for humor and storytelling and playful banter and all of that. And yet it's very balanced by this endurance, like the ability to stay in the same place doing the same thing, albeit with quality and purpose and and um like authentically as they can like as meaningfully as they can i think is the word uh but to survive for years in the same profession and and i personally find that very difficult like i i don't understand sometimes how it's possible like i i do know that i infp relative and it's like because the family needs him to work an extra job he works an extra job and at some point he accepted, this is what I need to do. And I care about these people enough that I'm going to do this. And to me, that's like really, it, it's it, just as the young INFP can potentially be quite self-involved or selfish. Oh, uh, how do I feel about it? I don't like it. It's making me upset. It doesn't feel harmonious. I'm like, you never mentioned anyone else in all of your thinking in the past hour um, versus the mature INFP who is really um, much more connected to their, their community and their purpose and their relationships. And then it becomes this, this act of support that comes in. Absolutely. I think that's well put. There are some INFPs with introverted feeling who can be self-indulgent with their emotions, but there are also INFPs who use their ability to clarify their values to be a force of good in many people's lives. So I find that with an INFP leading with introverted feeling, 
they feel like if they can control themselves, it'll help the people around them. So it's almost like instead of controlling other people directly, they usually take the approach of improving themselves first. So they're like, I, if I clarify my values, if I am able to understand my emotions better or become a better person myself, then that will ripple on to my relationships or helping other people or my causes in my life. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I feel like for all of the folks who have even decent access to FI, it very much is about how can I be the best possible example for others? And, you know, it's uh, work begins at home and work begins uh, with, uh, you know, making my bed and cleaning my room. And and that's I, I feel like that's a big part of, of introverted feeling when when it's um, not that self-indulgent version. Exactly. It makes a really good moral compass and it allows you to want to stay in congruence with what you deem to be important to you. Mm -hmm. and, so. and, and I do feel that there are INFPs who are sort of like in the middle of a process somewhere where they're grappling with the fact that some behavior that they have or some situation, how they're trying to handle it, uh, does not meet their ideal of how they feel they should do things. And then they feel horrible about themselves and beat themselves up. Uh, I mean, imagine like a very religious INFP or a very political INFP. And they have like these specific values and convictions. And then they're like, God, every step I'm taking, like I'm destroying the earth. Um, you know, I think that we can get a little carried away with that. Um, but to bring it more, more humbly, uh, more every day, it's, you know, like I know an INFP who, ex who expressed that anger is always wrong. And I'm like, no, I think like anger is built into the human condition. Like all of the different emotions that we as humans experience are built into our bodies and brains as mammals. And that they do serve a purpose. Like there is such a thing as righteous anger. Um, it, it is fair to be angry at being abused or something. Now, to get stuck in that is another story. Um, but but to then to hold this like unrealistic ideal that it is saying basically like makes it impossible for the INFP to be a human being. Like then then they're really setting themselves up for a lot of self torment. Uh, or in the worst case, projecting that onto other people um, and not dealing with it within themselves, but then like going after other people. Like, why aren't you doing this and why aren't you doing that? Um, so it, it can be very difficult. Like the hero, you know, the FI can really get themselves in a bind when they try to be perfect. Yeah, that need to be congruent with your values can turn into a self-deprecating, a self-beating up that, hey, you're not meeting these ideals that you see that you should be like, and that they're projected what they see as the best way to be. So, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, you're right about the crippling perfectionism. And so... Thank you so much, Dario, for coming out today. You were able to really share the complexity of the INFP personality. And we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.